Um, we're not talking about particular construction here. It's whether there are unique circumstances, is the request reasonable, and then uh, the uh, compatibility and contextual analysis with the essential character of the locality. And so we have a almost 10,000 square foot lot um, with uh, comprised of four smaller platted lots. And so that should form the basis for your analysis, not necessarily the new construction and the potential for damage with the new construction, which would all be addressed on a subsequent phase of analysis. Thank you, Mr. Nielsen. Is there any discussion on the motion? And I'll just note that the Planning Commission discussion um, really relied a lot on the context here. And, that, you know, this is a situation where um, you would end up with either smaller lots that are, you know, smaller than the other surrounding smaller lots or one of the biggest lots in the neighborhood. And so the Planning Commission discussed at length, after a lengthy public hearing, the sort of pros and cons of that. And I don't know that anyone felt sort of activist about density in Linden Hills. You're talking about one or two single family homes. Uh, but we did note the neighborhood organization support and having conversations with the 13th Ward office that the neighborhood is split on whether or not two families or one family should have the opportunity to live in a very desirable neighborhood. So again, I don't think it was sort of an activist statement from the Planning Commission, rather just a weighing of the legal context and the recommendation of our staff. I'd also note that I don't particularly appreciate people making ethical accusations to our very hardworking staff that spend their evenings at these meetings. And if you do have an ethical concern or complaint, we have a process um, you could talk to our city attorney or clerk about. Um, but that's a very serious accusation. Uh, you know, corruption or ethical standard breaking. And so I just wouldn't, I would encourage people not to sort of throw that around. And if you do have an ethical concern or complaint that we have a process to make complaints against staff or council members. Is there any further discussion? For Goodman. I didn't make any ethical complaints against anyone, so I hope that wasn't directed part at of me. the public hearings. Oh, okay. It's significant I, testimony in the public hearing. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, just feeling like you were responding to something that I said. I think uh, equal people can agree, disagree that either one house or two houses would be okay here. But it seems like this is a question of money, not a question of problem with building one house on one lot. I think people can have a different op difference of opinion with regard to the situation. I'm not bemoaning anyone. No one made the motion to do it in the other direction. So I made a motion and if, folks don't like it, which it sounds like they don't, they'll vote it down. No one made a motion to deny the appeal. Absolutely. Any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Nay? Okay, that motion fails. Would anyone make the alternative motion? Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will move then to, uh, I'll make sure I've got motion comment here. I will move to uh, deny the appeal. All right, is there any discussion on Councilmember Johnson's motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. That motion carries. Uh, and then we are uh, uh, finished with item number two. Thank you for coming. And if you have any process questions, the clerk again or the city attorney and staff can answer any of the appeal uh, procedural questions that you might have. And I know Ms. Widmeyer, thank you for being so responsive to so many questions. Uh, item number three is the uh, appeal of the demolition of an historic resource at 2620 West 44th Street. Thank you for everyone who stayed through the uh, previous public hearings and for your patience in our uh, committee meeting today. We're going to make sure that everyone has a chance to speak for this item as well. And then we do have the final item uh, for discussion, which is item number six. So we're going to try to move along so that our council colleagues can stay through those as well. All right. Welcome, All right. Mr. Hanauer. Thank you, Chair Bender and council members. The demolition of historic resource application for the Brenda Ulam residence at 2620 West 44th Street in Linden Hills. CPED did recommend that the uh, HPC deny the demolition permit and, for the residence and to direct the planning director to prepare or cause to prepare a designation study. The HPC upheld that recommendation six to one and the applicants, Mr. Gross, or Mr. John Gross and Andrew Commerce did appeal that de denial of the demolition permit. Subject property is just west of Lake Harriet, modest two-story home on the north side of West 44th Street. And just a quick review of the ordinance that's, that uh, helps outlay how you do the findings is the review um, is that you have three options. One is if the committee determines the property is not a historic resource, 
then the committee can approve the demolition permit. And two, if the committee does determine that the property is a historic resource, the committee shall deny the demolition permit and direct the plan director to prepare or cause to prepare the designation study. And that third option is even if you do see this as a historic resource, but there that the applicant does make the findings that there are no reasonable alternatives, then you can also approve the demolition of the historic resource. And I bring that up uh, to sum up the applicant's reason for appeal. They bring up two reasons, and I hope to sum it up correct, um, accurately, in that they do not, they do not uh, contest that Brundeland was a significant person. It was that this residence is not histor historically significant. And even if you do find this property historically significant, they state, and they have more additional information in your packets, that the prop, there's no reasonable alternatives to demolition. So, uh, as mentioned, subject property is uh, staff made the recommendation that was uh, significant based on criterion criterion two um, properties associated with the life of a significant person, and this being Brenda Lind for contributions to the literary field. It's worth noting that the Linden Hill Small Area Plan did note that this was a potential historic resource within the 2013 Small Area Plan. Quick summary of Brenda Ulan, born in 1891, raised in Minneapolis around 1909, heads to New York for college, 1913, graduates. After, after that, she moves back to Minneapolis for about a year and is an early female reporter for the Minneapolis Tribune and the St. Paul Daily Times. Just a short time after that, 1915, moves back to, Minneapolis, uh, moves, moves back to New York where she continues her writing career. It's an impressive array of of publications that she's writ wrote for, Harper's, Collier's, Ladies Home Journal, and general interest magazines like Saturday Evening Post and Liberty, where she was likely the first female reporter. In this time, she she married, had, had her daughter, and divorced. And um, it's worth noting her husband, this was in her memoir, but um, actually uh, second source, that her husband was notably su unsuccessful in his business ventures, leaving Brenda to support herself and her daughter through freelance writing, this being the 19 teens and 20s. By 1930, she, uh, with the Great Depression, aging father and strong family connection, she moves back to Minneapolis, lived at her childhood home, 3830 West Lake Helen Parkway, or also often known as 3850 Richfield Road until 1947. And she wrote her most two most popular well-known pieces. Uh, 1938 was the book, If You Want to Write, sold over 300,000 copies to date and 1939, her memoir, Me, both published by Putnam. 1941 to 1948, she, she's a columnist for the Minneapolis Daily Times, and 1946 awarded the Knights of St. Olaf Medal by the Norwegian government for coverage of, of the Quisling trial in Norway. The, this property, it was demolished in 1953. Uh, Ms. Brenda Ulin moved to the subject property in 1954 uh, 1964 and uh, 1954 and at the age of 63 and she lived there until she was 93 when she passed away in 1985. She continued her literary work writing for two smaller publications. She wrote a book that was published by a local local publisher Metropolis in the North High Band. Wrote essays that were later later published in, in collections of her writings and wrote a biography of her mother that was was published posthumously. She organized her work and she just continued to write and do work in the literary field and um, continuing to organize her work and it stated in the Star Tribune interview in 1983, what I'm trying to do now is put together my collected work and get it decently typed up so it won't be thrown in the posthumous ash can. Um, and thanks to this work, there is a large collection of her writings at the Minnesota Historical Society. So also just mentioned that she was also a mentor at, and a lot of that took place at this residence with uh, Patricia Hempel, Karen Weiniger, Bruce Carlson, and Eric Utney. I'll just point out one other, a quote from one of the mentors or mentees that she had, and that was George Sheehan, who is a New York Times bestselling author in writing, stating that one of the joys of my life was receiving letters from Brenda Euland when she died. I lost more than a good friend, I lost a mentor who inspired me to do my best. During the last 10 years of her life, Brenda sent messages that saw me through the bad days writers always have. So um, 
we definitely realize that Brenda Ulan is not a household name citywide, but that there are contributions that she did make in her literary career over 70 years, and, and some of those did take place at this residence. Prolific writer, had four books published, high praise for the books that she did, she did write, and um, I'll just, I'm almost done here, but uh, the great American poet Carl Sandburg said that if, but the book, if you want to write, that was the best book on writing ever written at that time. Um, her memoir by Alice Kaplan, said, uh, she said it was a pioneering book that one of the first in an autobiographical tradition that gives value to everyday experience. And just noted in Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine, 2003, that she was one of the top 10 local authors. So also it's, it's seen in, in, a, in, in our research that she was well ahead of her time. Uh, Patricia Hempel said she was a rule-breaking woman, someone that rode her charger against an essential Victorian barricade. And, and uh, just the accomplishments that she made at the time are impressive. When looking at evaluating a property for association with a significant person, we look to the National Register Bulletin, three-step process, you determine whether the importance of the individual associated with the property, we feel that that has been made. I don't think the applicant or the, the appellant would argue that she was an important person for her contributions. For step two, it's determining whether the property is significant based on the length and nature of the individual's relationship to the property. Ideally, we want that property that's historically significant to be the one that she did her most important work. And that property, that property is no longer, it's, it's demolished. So then the National Register goes on to provide guidance that some properties might be eligible as the only surviving property associated with a significant individual or that represent the culmination of an important career. And it also states in this bulletin that such a property might include a person's last home, even if most or all of their her significant accomplishments occurred before she lived in the, in the house. So like I said, undoubtedly that house that was just south of Lake Calhoun was her most important home, but there is enough there that we feel that, that she did contribute to the literary field while, while living here that, that warrants a look at a designation study. I'll just, uh, you know, she, she Brenda Uland in, in some of her writings, here's one of her quotes saying, uh, it's kind of an old bum house, talking about 2620 West 44th Street, but I could afford it. And so she realized it was not a grand, grand home. But a number of our landmarks in Minneapolis are not those grand homes, including the Lena Smith House and the cottages in, in Linden Hills. And finally, the, the third step is the, to assess the historic integrity of the home. We do, staff did feel that the property does retain its historic integrity, architectural integrity. And that, once again, uh, there has been few alterations since since she lived there. So going back to the ordinance and and the three options before you for this application is to not see it as a historic resource and allow the demolition, to see it as a historic resource and to commence a designation study, or third, to see if the applicant or the appellant has made the the, the case that there are no reasonable alternatives. And I'll just point to where the arrow is of, in determining whether reasonable alternatives exist, the commission shall consider the significance and integrity of the property, the economic value of the existing structure, including its current use, cost of renovation, and feasible alternative uses. Um, the applicant did provide a lot of financial numbers. They, they estimate that the overall cost to renovate it and to sell it, on, to sell it would be 1.3 million is what it would cost. And there would be a gap of about $800,000 of what they had purchased the pro property for. Um, and just that the, they just state that the finances are not there to make it work. And we definitely do realize that the, that the uh, land to home value is well out of proportion, the land being three times the valuation of, of the home currently, and in part it is because the property is zoned R4. But we, we do see that there may be reasonable alternatives to help reduce the gap, and that being a possible accessory dwelling unit or two in the back of the lot. So the applicant has made the offer of a mitigation plan, and that being a commemoration of Brenda Ulan, either at the Linden Hills Library 
or perhaps at Lake Harriet, where she was often associated with. Um, finally, public comments. There is a lot, and I think over 50, both for and against the, the demolition. You had some passionate and eloquent letters stating what Brenda Eula meant to them, but then you also had a number of letters in support of the demolition of, of the property and a testimonial to the developers in, in the work that they've done around here. So I just wanted to sum that up. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for staff before we open the public hearing? Okay, I don't see any. Thank you for the presentation, uh, Mr. Hanauer. Uh, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. So I know we have a lot of people signed in and maybe others who would like to speak. Um, I think for this one, maybe it makes sense to start with the applicant and just kind of go through, you know, there's been a lot of discussion back and forth and maybe we'll kind of end there as well in case there's anything that you need to respond to from the testimony. That would be great, thank you. Um, Committee members, I'm Carol Lansing. I'm an attorney at Fabry Baker Daniels. I'm representing the property owners, John Gross and Andrew Comers. Um, also today with our team is Megan Elliott of Preservation Design Works. Um, in these debates, a lot of the discussion is about whether the person who lived in the building was significant or an organization that used the building was significant or the architect. And those stories are intriguing and compelling and more interesting than the other factors that you must consider. Um, we're here today to talk about those other factors. Um, whatever reactions you have to the story of Brenda Eulen, um, we believe that the City Council um, is compelled in this case um, to approve demolition of the building because there are no other reasonable alternatives. In determining whether reasonable alternatives exist, the Council shall consider three factors, the significance of the property, the integrity of the property, and the economic value or usefulness of the existing structure including its current use, cost of renovation, and feasible alternative uses. With respect to significance, um, often there is a case that can be made, but that doesn't mean you have to, um, therefore, designate or preserve a building. You need to look at the relative significance, and in this case, we believe it's low because it's not associated with um, the works that Brenda Eulen is most known for um, and doesn't represent her legacy. Uh, preservation of a private home will do nothing to enhance or perpetuate her legacy. Um, Megan Elliott will speak further to the purpose of historic preservation in commemorating and recognizing significant people. With respect to the integrity of the house, integrity means its ability to convey the significance of Brenda Eulen through the presence and condition of its physical materials and, and um, status. Um, in this case, that integrity is greatly diminished because the interior of the house has been gutted. We understand that neighbors have concerns and emotions around redevelopment and some of the um, communications you've had have been about what's coming next. Um, we think it is relevant to your consideration of economic value usefulness of this property to recognize that it has been zoned R4 for a long time. It's in an area of R4 zoning and so both the market value and the land use planning value of this property is not as a single family home. And with respect to what comes next, neighbors and the city will have the opportunity to participate and review that through the normal processes um, at, a, at planning commission. Um, John and Andrew will speak further to the severe economic hardship that preservation of this house will cause them and the lack of any reasonable economic uses of the property. Many have been suggested, but none of them are reasonable. Um, we recognize and respect the passionate testimony that you will hear today um, about Brenda Eulen. At the end, however, we hope that you will conclude that preservation of this house does not preserve her legacy and that there is no reasonable alternative to demolition. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Megan Elliott and I am representing PDN, also known as Preservation Design Works. Some of you know what we do at PDN. Some of you have had the opportunity to work with on projects in Minneapolis, historic preservation projects, and I think some transformative ones like the Hollywood Theater, CA Smith Lumber District, PD Plaza. I think you know that our office is exclusively dedicated to increasing the use and viability of existing and historic sites. I built the company about five years ago. We have architectural historians, we have social historians, we have historical architects, we have other professionals that just focus on that mission. So that being said, 
this is a really unusual and frankly unsettling place for me to be. This is not the topic I usually speak to. Um, so you might be wondering, why am I here? Why am I speaking on behalf of this project? And the reason I decided uh, to be here today is because there's two very important factors that influenced me to start a company in preservation and to do the work that we do. The first is that we sincerely believe in the value of heritage. We believe in the value that that brings to a place. We think it should be interpreted, shared, understood, learned from. The second is that we think from a municipal perspective, it's a really important tool for economic development and long range planning. In this case, we don't think this particular local designation meets either of those goals. I think it's really unfortunate, and this is another goal of mine that we can talk about somewhere else, that we have a very limited toolbox as a city to integrate heritage into our um, process and culture and understanding. We have one tool, and that's designating a local structure, and that's it. And I think that's actually a problem across the preservation industry in general, is that we don't have a lot of ways that are recognized for integrating cultural heritage. That being said, we all in this room, I think I can say all of us in this room, agree that Brenda Ulan was significant. She is significant. Her work is significant. It had a tremendous impact on Minneapolis. It will continue to impact everyone here and future writers as well. So then designating this local house, in my mind, almost undermines her significance. because It's almost not worthy of representing her work. Um, I think it, I think it does lack integrity. I think there have been a lot of changes to the house. The front porch has been modified. There's been a rear addition. The materials have deteriorated. From a local perspective, we don't usually talk about the interior at all. Um, but I, and I've never been to the interior from what I understand. It's been substantially gutted and there isn't any representation of where she worked remaining in the house. And as far as association goes, she was a professional writer. She had a tremendous body of work. None of that work was None of the most influential work, I should say, was created this house. Um, and that work wasn't about this house. So for the past few months that I've been working with John and Andrew, I can honestly say I've been really impressed with the amount of effort and time and thoughtfulness that they've spent trying to understand Euland and her work. They put together a number of proposals for increasing access to her work and for interpreting her work. And despite all the limits that we have as a preservation industry and with our ordinance, I think that what they're trying to do really is heritage preservation. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi there. Um, I'm John Gross, and this is Andrew Commerce, and we're the appellants. Um, and we'd just like to give a little bit of background really quick. I know we've got a lot of folks who want to speak behind us. And then go into the economic issue and, and go over that those numbers as quickly as we can. Oh, need glasses to begin. And thank you for letting us speak, committee. I would encourage you to be brief on those items just to mm -hmm. kind of focus on this historic issue and then maybe yeah. anticipating questions about what's planned to go in, just maybe some very high level discussion of that. Okay. Okay. Um, I think there's uh, just a frame issue, which is that we are not large merchant builders that kind of zip in and roll out. We are in the community and all the work we've done has been in the community. And um, Andrew has worked decades for art space, doing adaptive reuse. I have done that in my career with art space and then on my own and created in Linden Hills, the uh, Upton 43 building, which the city had recommended that I tear down and I wanted to save, which we did and have two beautiful restaurants in there, Southwest Auto. Preservation is what we have done our entire lives and, and we take this very seriously. So the thing is that we also live in the neighborhood. I've lived across the street from this very property for 22 years and Andrew lived in Linden Hills for a number of years. Um, so the neighborhood, its growth, its development is very important to us. So we are, um, there's, my neighbors are here. They're all people that I see around, and there's kind of the two camps, those who are concerned with what comes next as a development, and that's not the right thing for this meeting, and then those who have a fondness for Brenda Euland. And um, what we'll show in the economic is that the, the weak correlation is um, too costly for us, but also too costly for the neighborhood. And then the other very important point is 
usually standing before you at developers asking for something to be given to them. It's zoned R2, we want R6, we want to build bigger than what we have. We bought this on the open market. It was an R4. It's been an R4 for 50 years plus. It's the city's intent always that this have higher density. And we are the ones stepping in to act on this. So we're not asking for something. We're asking that you don't take something away from us and from the neighborhood at large. So let me just jump in quickly um, to the economics. And we gave you a work sheet or a, a sheet we provided. Um, and I'll rip through this as quickly as I can. But before us also is the idea that it may make sense to study this for 18 months. And for us, the economic factors just get worse over 18 months because our holding costs are about, will be about $10,000 a month. So adding $180,000 to get 18 months out and say, now what? It's still gonna be the same set of economic factors I'll print, present below. But um, the high level it's, uh, 12,000 square foot parcel located in Linden Hills, mid distance between the village and Lake Harriet. Um, it, as I said, was not designated and was zoned R4. We paid 840,000 for that parcel. Uh, and our purchase price was $68 a square foot, which was actually lower than the $87 a square foot that land goes for in Linden Hills. And we've got footnotes and, and 50 pages of backup to all of this that will be in a, another packet. Um, we, we are, our intent is to do a single lot development. Um, there's also talk about how this plays out to other lots. We don't own the lot on one side. We do own the house on the other side, but it's a million dollar house and it's not gonna be taken down. So um, the city had intended this always to be developed. And, and a very important thing is that the difference in tax value of if this house cannot be demolished, then it doesn't have land value. It now has just kind of an old out of service house value, which would be about $340,000. That difference um, between what the city can tax that and what they could tax our development is uh, 30 times greater. And so we'll, we'll come back to that. But jumping in, uh, one question is, could we do this as an as is sale in that? The current value as a house is 340,000. We paid 840, we would lose 500,000. Um, the rehab and sell, so the thought as well, if you fix it up, it could be better. The cost again of 840, by the time you rehabilitate it, there's structural issues as well as aesthetic issues and trying to get this thing up to a certain level. Um, it would take about a million three to get it to Acquire it, repair it, and we've already acquired it, but repair it and rehabilitate the house. So then our loss pushes up to 805,000 under that scenario. So then we say, well, what about an as is rental? Um, it's been difficult to rent and getting a longer term rental, we have in there a rental income of $1,500, which is low, but we have a rental agent that has cooperated that. But even if you push the number up higher to $2,500, um, it covering monthly payments for financing and holding costs, we would still lose $6,300 a month. I'm sorry, $6,600 per month, every month as an as it is rental. Um, the same holds true of the rehabilitation and rental. That loss is even greater because of the greater cost. We would lose 